thoughts uh, with presentations today by both Tim Walsh and Jim Hedrick, both with Oswald. We will begin uh, here in maybe about one minute. Um, allow a few others to uh, join us. Tim Linville, Kent Kreitzer, I see you joined us. Welcome. with the uh, April 22nd webinar, uh, update on insurance landscape after COVID-19. Um, I'm Glenn Chumate, uh, CEA and uh, Construction Employers Association is pleased to continue to try to engage uh, the construction industry and our members uh, during this uh, time of social distancing and continuing to try to advance the industry. Um, we do so through our website, cacisp.org, where you can find uh, a number of updates uh, on COVID and other construction information. We also uh, send out regular newsletter email alerts uh, weekly. And uh, if you're not a subscriber, uh, you can go to our website and uh, look for industry updates and uh, register for newsletters. Uh, we also um, have regular webinars like this, and once our social distancing is over, we'll go back to live in-person educational classes. Um, today's webinar, again, is on um, insurance update and how to prepare and plan for the coming months. And we're pleased to have uh, Tim Walsh and Jim Hedrick from Oswald. Uh, the areas that will be covered today, uh, a little bit of an update and on learnings from what we've learned from COVID-19, uh, discussions around insurance policies, procedure documentation, um, business priority reviews, uh, thoughts on de-escalation and guidance, as well as what you can do uh, to prepare and mitigate uh, for COVID-19. I'm going to give a little bit of background on our two presenters and turn it over to them uh, for uh, the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, Tim Walsh is a Senior Vice President, uh, Director of Design and Construction with Oswald Companies. Um, Oswald um, is a major insurance company uh, located in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, they're employee owned. Um, Tim uh, serves as the uh, strategic advisor for large construction clients. Uh, he's also a risk advisor on over 500 construction projects. He has uh, extensive experience in contract reviews, feasibility analysis, insurance program designs, and marketing. Um, he is a uh, graduate of the University of Denver, and uh, we're pleased to have him uh, with his colleague, uh, Jim Heidrich, who uh, works out of the Cincinnati office for Oswald Insurance. Jim has 25 years of risk management, loss control experience. Um, experience includes uh, development and maintenance of health and safety programs, risk management, and business continuity programs. Um, Jim is a graduate of the Illinois State University, Industrial Technology and Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, we're pleased to uh, have both of you um, on the session. We'd ask that uh, all guests would mute their microphones so that there's uh, as little background noise and information as possible. There is also, um, if you, as you have questions, if you encourage questions, uh, there's a, a chat box uh, on your screen on the right where you can enter questions and we will uh, have our speakers and presenters uh, share information uh, with you. Um, we also have a few other uh, sessions coming up, which we'll talk to you about later and or if there are other topics which you feel are important that we know about and or discuss, we'd uh, encourage you to uh, let us know. So for today's uh, presentation, uh, Jim, would you uh, turn the mic and uh, speaker and presentation over to you and Tim? Great. Thanks, Glenn. Uh -huh. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So um, 
you know, a couple of weeks ago, we did the um, CNA webinar. We lined out a checklist of insurance coverages that could potentially be triggered for claims and liabilities rising out of COVID-19 losses. And at that time, we discussed that, you know, any claim determination is very fact dependent on the claim allegation, specific language within the policy, and how the corp courts are going to interpret that policy language. So ultimately, the insurance company and, and perhaps the courts can make the final determination or the official determination of coverage. So what I thought we'd do today that would be beneficial for the group is just to give you an update on recent insurance related developments on both the state and national level. And it's been extremely fluid. We probably spend, I probably spend two or three hours a day um, on this issue, just getting updates. And uh, so I just wanna bring you up to speed on, on what's happening both within Ohio and nationally. So uh, within the states, um, some of the states have granted grace periods for premium payments. Uh, they've delayed cancellations of insurance policies due to non-payment of premium. Um, they also have a grace period for non-renewing uh, certain insurance policies. And I'm sure you've seen the commercials. Uh, a lot of the uh, personal auto insurance carriers have offered refunds um, uh, you know, to uh, you know, personal auto owners. Uh, some states, however, have also extended that to various degrees on commercial lines, mainly workers' compensation. And then a development really over the last uh, couple of weeks has been where some states have come out and affirmatively granted work comp coverage for first responders and healthcare workers. And so, um, you know, this, they, they call it a uh, inclusive presumption where if you're a healthcare worker or first responder, um, you will be granted workers' compensation coverage. Uh, you don't have to go through a higher level of, of proving that you contracted the, uh, the occupational disease from uh, a work activity. Um, I, I know uh, recently uh, Gavin Newsom in California um, put out a statement that they were looking to expand that beyond just the first responders, um, although there was nothing as of this morning on that. And one of the things I think is really interesting, so the, the Workers' Compensation Insurance Bureau in California um, did a, uh, a report last week, and they, uh, it's called uh, Cost Evaluation of Potential Inclusive COVID-19 Presumption in California Workers' Compensation. So just to give you a, a little bit of a framework about what the cost element of this is, um, they estimated that the cost for that presumptive um, coverage would range in the area of 2.2 billion to 33.6 billion dollars, and this is just the state of California. Uh, it's a pretty interesting report. You can get it online. One of the one of the interesting things I found was that you know they're anticipating in this study that about 80% of the claims would have mild or no hospitalization. And the average cost for both indemnity and medical benefits would run about $1,400. And I think that's where you know, most people think, oh, you have a work comp claim, you, know, they, they, you pay for them to go get tested and that's it. But what, what's interesting is they were estimating 15% of those claims would involve hospitalization without ICU. And that would um, have an average cost of $53,400. They also estimated 4.3% of the cases would include an ICU, which would be $137,000, and less than 1% would be death, which they estimated $333,000 per claim. Hey, Jim, so this, can you hold one second? Sure. Um, I just want to make an announcement. There's, um, We'd ask that everyone mute their microphones because we can hear background noise from someone moving around. Um, and we'd appreciate so that we have a clear connection that uh, everyone would mute their uh, speakers, microphones, or if you're on a, some other device, try to find a way to mute noise. Uh, sorry about that, Jim, but go ahead. Thanks, Glenn. 
So, um, you know, kind of related to this, um, I, I saw an article of a um, uh, an interview an attorney had given to Bloomberg News, and I think it kind of sets the tone for a little bit of this. It says there's likely to be many workers' comp compensation claims because of the ease of filing, and there's no requirement to prove negligence. And for so many people, their greatest contact with others is at the work. And the the attorney that was being interviewed said, Present, presumptive presumption legislation promises to be a boom for claimants' attorneys who will take a percentage of the permanent disability awarded. He goes on to say, you are just dangling meat in front of hungry lions. So that's the environment that we're in. And, um, and uh, that's what we're starting to see on the state statewide level. Jim? Next slide. Thank you. Um, we are also um, starting to see certain states that have come out and said that property coverage uh, does affirm um, business income losses due to the virus, um, even if there's a virus or a communicable disease exclusion on the policy. So I've listed on the on the slide, you know, um, there's about seven uh, states uh, so far that have come out with that state legislation. I'll talk to Ohio specifically. One of the things to keep in mind is it's generally tied to small businesses. And depending on the um, legislation, they define small business as less than 100, 150, or 250 uh, cases. Um, we're also starting to see a much more of a, a prevalence of class action lawsuits for business income under property coverage. And may, some of you may have even been contacted by law firms um, already. Um, there, what's interesting is uh, Travelers reported their earnings yesterday, Travelers Insurance, and on their analyst call, um, they were the first carrier that I was aware of that actually took a charge for COVID-19. They took an $86 million charge in the quarter, and, um, uh, and it, and it it wasn't really rising out of construction related claims, but they're, they've already received a number of class action lawsuits uh, relating to the manufacturing distribution of hand sanitizer and the development of, of the COVID-19 um, vaccine. So we're gonna just see a whole lot of um, additional uh, class action lawsuits that are coming out of this. And then finally, on a federal level, we talked about this last time, there is the um, uh, there's a draft of a bill at the federal level called the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act of 2020, and uh, this acts similar to TRIA, uh, uh, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, in that it would be a reimbursement uh, for insurers that pay out claims for TRIA. It's in draft form now; hasn't been introduced. Um, but it's, I, there's no language in the bill itself that's retroactive to cover this event. Hopefully, if it does get enacted and there's another event, we're all retired by that point. All right, Jim, next slide. Uh, in terms of Ohio, uh, so you should be aware that the um, uh, Ohio Department of Insurance put out both in 2020-07. It gave a 60-day grace period for premium payments. And what's important to know there is you have 60 days to make that payment. However, it does not waive payments. And if you don't pay your premium uh, at the end of the 60 days, um, it may be subject to retroactive cancellation back to the original due date. So just be aware of that um, and that no policies can be canceled for non-payment during this uh, state of emergency. In addition to that, the Ohio BWC, uh, I'm sure if you're insured with them, you already know, they declared a $1.6 billion dividend, which uh, um, amounted to about 100% of the premiums that they charge for the 1819 policy period. And then uh, they just came out with a new class code, workers' compensation class called um, 8871, which they're calling clerical telecommuter. And um, you have to contact the BWC in order to get that code on your policy. Uh, but presumably, the, the rate is much lower than you would perhaps in your self-performed or 
or your other uh, workers' compensation class codes. Next slide. Uh, in terms of um, Ohio legislation, uh, this gets back to this whole declaring that the insurance policy should pay out uh, business income losses under uh, property um, property policies. Uh, House Bill 850, or 589 was introduced on March 24th uh, by Representative uh, Crossman of the 15th District and Representative Rogers of District 60. And uh, basically it says that um, if you had a policy in force um, when the governor declared the emergency on March 9th, even if you were to have virus or um, uh, um, communicable disease exclusions, you would have coverage under your property policy. And then uh, it goes on to say that losses after the declared uh, state of emergency would not be covered. So that was introduced. I checked this morning. There's been no uh, movement on the bill. And again, this is similar to about seven other states. So Tim, on, on that legislation, is there a view from the insurance industry um, about the uh, support for the bill or opposition of the bill? And is it passed in other states? Uh, it has not passed in other states. The, um, the insurance industry has not been in favor of the bill. Um, in the in the sense that the um, the policies never contemplated it, and, and I'm going to share some statistics with you here shortly. Uh, Jim, why don't you flip the slide there? I'll share some statistics with you in a minute that will kind of underscore uh, some of the challenges with this. So, you know, House Bill 589 it only applies to businesses located in Ohio. It only applies to business businesses with employees of 100 or fewer employees and that were in effect on the uh, effective date. Um, it was uh, the superintendent of insurance under the bill would set up a, an assessment based on 2019 written premiums for all insurers in the state of Ohio. And then he would reimburse insurers out of this fund called the Business Interruption Insurance Fund. So. I did a little research and I, to see, you know, and this will go to, go to that point, Glenn. So in, in 2018, which is the last uh, most recent report I, I was able to find from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the property casualty insurance premium was about 621 billion. And of the 621 billion, 55% of that was personal lines insurance and 45% of that was commercial lines insurance. Of the uh, $621 billion, 6 percent of that represents what we call multi parallel or property coverage. And for the last three years, that line of coverage has um, lost money for the industry. Their, their, what they call combined ratio is in excess of 100% for that line of coverage for the past three years. In the state of Ohio, as of uh, for 2018, the total written premiums were about $17 billion. And presumably that's how it would get assessed back to those, um, those insurers. But if the national trend of 6% is only property coverage within that 17 billion, that means that there's about a billion dollars that the insurers collected from the from the uh, from property insurance, and so the you know the the challenge is really the the uh, business income losses are going to be just extremely substantial, and will literally throw the insurance market into the same state of emergency as the financial market back in the uh, 08 09 up here. All right, uh, next slide. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll just conclude with this. Some recent developments, you know, so the insurance underwriters and the sureties are requiring more information. Uh, they want to know uh, what employers uh, are doing relative to PPE, social distancing. Uh, they're very interested in liquidity. I was on a call this week uh, with a surety underwriter who um, uh, said, you know, 2019 uh, financials are, are, are uh, are dated material. They're really looking for current information 
to understand the liquidity and how each of the um, uh, clients are dealing with um, subcontractor defaults and um, uh, material supply um, supply chain disruptions. And um, we're also seeing that there's a longer underwriting process. So uh, part of that's because all the insurance companies are working remote, so it's difficult to um, uh, get a hold of underwriters. Uh, but they also have a lot of business on their on their plates right now, and um, the the whole process is just kind of slowed down. And then there's a question about future capacity issues. Before we got into this crisis, uh, auto rates for the last couple of years had already been going up uh, due to adverse loss experience, and the excess liability from Q4 2019 on has been a really in a state of flux with carriers dropping limits from 25 million down to 10 million and increasing the, their rates. Uh, we believe that if there's additional deterioration on the underwriting results as response to, as, as respects to COVID-19, that that's further gonna diminish the amount of capacity or insurance limits that the carriers are gonna put out. And then finally, AM Best, um, they did put out a recent um, uh, guidance on the U.S. commercial lines industry. They dropped it from an um, uh, from um, the outlook to negative for the U.S. commercial lines, and they held they held the purse lines as stable. Uh, so it's it's a very difficult environment from the insurance perspective. Um, and I'm I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. But that just gives you an update on what's happening. Jim, any questions? Jim? Jim? Yeah, no questions have come in on the chat. Um, maybe uh, we can open it back up for questions again as we move a little bit forward into the presentation. Does that sound like a good plan, Tim? Yep, that sounds great. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you and you can talk about right, pandemic planning. Yeah, so, so what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about pandemic planning and what to expect over the, the next 12 to 18 months. Um, I'm going to be moving pretty quickly because I have a lot of material here, and I just really wanted to, to pique your interest to a degree. Um, I've been doing pandemic planning for about 15 years, so this is something I've been working on for a number of years. So, you know, I think it's got some pretty good insight into the subject. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like, what you can be doing now, as well as, you know, as a business, how should you, how can you be managing the different tools you can use to mitigate the risk that you have, as well as a little bit on project restart. You know, we, we really want you to take a lot of time to, to learn, you know, about the, the last 60 days, you know, we are likely going to experience these, these conditions again at some point in the fashion, so let, let's learn from that. Um, you know, and there's going to be some obstacles that come up against as well, so I'll get moving pretty quickly. So I don't expect you to read this, but when you think of a pandemic during the peak periods, whenever you're doing any level of planning, you need to set some sort of assumptions about the conditions that you feel you will likely um, experience during those periods. You know, some of the high level ones is during the, the big peak period, 30 to 40 percent absenteeism. I think we've all seen that. I predict there will be multiple waves you know, two, three, if not four waves, um, depending on how we handle our social distancing. So think about this for the long haul, you know, how can you take advantage of this opportunity as an organization? Um, you know, we're gonna have periods of normalcy between these waves, so you know, we'll really think about that. So over a period of time, you know, I don't know what the waves will look like. You hear about compressing the wave, you know. What I cannot tell and understand or wrap my mind around is when we compress the wave, is that still going to be part of this first wave, for example, or does that hold things off to a, a second wave? My concern is that when we let, let out some of the restrictions that we have in place is that the current wave continues and it starts to just spike back up a little bit. And I think we all need to, to be able to monitor that as quickly as we can. And, and to, to, bring, to put some thought behind the fact of how long a pandemic is going to last, the only way a pandemic really ends is once everyone on the planet has been come, become exposed to the virus, and that's either through a vaccine, through, through uh, getting antibodies, get, getting better, or getting sick and not getting better. So 
So if you think about those waves from a, a, a planning perspective, I, I think you're, you'll be best suited to look at those waves within stages. So kind of like the, the wave, the stages inside the wave. You know, if you think back over time where you, when you first start paying attention to this down here in the green, you know, was it when things were happening in China or was it when the first cases started to happen in Seattle and California? So, you know, think through that, you know, think through what those stages look like, what you did in the past. And I'm encouraging you right now to, to really put your own definitions around these stages within the waves that you learned from what you've done in the past. You know, then, then the next stage, if you recall, some people started, we started having clusters across the United States. Started having our first local case. I, mean, I still remember the day when the first local case was uh, um, shared in Cleveland. Changed the game for everyone. So, you know, right now we're kind of in this period of being closed in the black stage, and it's starting to extend it, extend into the part that businesses are closed and they're really struggling facing the uh, challenges of whether they're going to be able to continue as I did pre COVID. And then starting to de escalate, this is absolutely as important or more important than the front part of this way. When you start to look at this, you know, you need to start playing how am I going to bring my operations back? How am I going to increase certain measures in the workplace? How will I decrease other things? And as that the conditions change locally, your planning efforts and your actions should uh, change as well. So I, I encourage you to break these waves down into stages. And something else I will add is you're going to have a period of normalcy between these waves. You know, let, let's really, really take advantage of that, you know, um, try and define what the new normal looks like to you. It may be a physical environment type conversation, or it may be my entire business has changed. You know, my the focus I had before COVID is totally different than what I'm going to have after COVID. You know, really start thinking about new opportunities. You know, there may be situations where a particular sector is starting to really get increased attention. In the medical supply space, for example, if you support that industry, you know what, your business model is changing. So let's think about those um, periods. So the whole goal here is if you plan, I really feel you can accelerate your recovery time efforts. So if you if you use that, the concept of first to market, if you're one of the first ones who are ready to attack this period between waves, you're going to have a distinct competitive advantage. And I hope that makes sense to everyone. I'm trying to go a little quick here, but I want you to recognize and, and accept um, multiple waves, periods in between waves, and how to break those down and how you can execute throughout the duration of the pandemic. Does anybody have any questions about what can be expected during the pandemic? If not, I can move on to what I think you should be doing now. Okay. All right, so what should you be doing now? You know, I've kind of alluded to this, but you should be learning, planning, and preparing. And by learning, you know, it, I think everyone's made pretty good decisions as to what they should be doing during uh, COVID-19 because it's been a pretty slow-moving event. With that said, that seems kind of odd because if you look at the past 60 days, it seems like a blur. But, you know, let's take the opportunity right now to pause, look back and document what we did and why we did it based on the, the local conditions. You know, was it a DeWine order? Was it a um, the first local case in, in your organization? You know, what triggered you to make those actions and really, really evaluate those and apply that to, to going forward? That's going to help you not only plan for the future wave, it's going to help you plan for how to de-escalate and how to prepare for the next wave. You know, you also, like I said, may identify some opportunities. You know, keep an eye out for those. They, they will present themselves in unique ways, whether it's, you know, uh, starting to partner with friendly competitors, frenemies, to use the NASCAR term, um, or, you know, employees are out there who may be looking for work that you wouldn't have had access to in the past. Um, situational awareness, you know, in addition to documenting what you've done in the past, situational awareness is absolutely so key. I cannot emphasize that enough, you know. Um, when you look back, and I, I think of situational awareness from a, a global perspective, I think of it from a national, state, local, as well as your, your own organization, as well as your suppliers and and your uh, your customers. So, you know, I want you to, to make sure that you've identified the information that is important to you 
for it to be available in order for you to make good decisions. And I want you to document that. I want you to, to spell that out as to what each piece of information will be and why you need it. As you identify those categories and sources of information, please, please, please think about starting to capture that information on a, if not weekly, or if not daily basis, at least a, a weekly basis, and just keep a running total, because you will start to see trends as to what is going on within a, the community and within your organization. Um, think about your employee communication. Um, has it been timely? Has it been adequate? You know, do people have questions that you're not answering? You know, I think what, what I've been seeing is companies have all been doing most of the right thing, in my opinion. However, they're not always sharing that with their employees. And as a result is when you don't have information, you always filled in with your worst fears and concerns. So you know, I encourage you to make sure that employee communication is open, honest, and absolutely transparent. Also, when we've gone through these different stages from the, the initial the, the stage to the essential workplace, now we're going to start bringing back some non-essential people. Make sure that all of your actions are coordinated across the company. Make sure that um, when your human resources group moves forward with a policy that it makes sense with the rest of the organization from the, the operations side, maybe even the IT side. Just make sure we're in proper alignment with one another and, and keep that communication consistent. Here's a sample of a planning matrix, matrix that you can use. It's very simple. Um, helps you keep everything in alignment. So as we move from green to gray. This allows me to understand what group, business group I am in, but then also allows everyone in the organization to understand what I'm doing as well as for you to have the opportunity to understand what they're doing. Having conversations in advance of these coming stages is invaluable to, to, to making the right decisions and making coordinated response and efforts. So, just a, a little simple planning tool, and you can do the exact same thing for communication to your employees and your uh, other external stakeholders, whether it be uh, suppliers, subs, whoever it may be, just put different names across the top. It's an absolutely tremendous tool, and it's a very simple tool that you can use. Also, take a look at your, your, your pay policies or your, your human resources policies, your employee policies. Have you modified them for the, uh, the pandemic event to deal with increased absenteeism, emergency pay policies? social distancing, whatever it may be, make sure you're documenting those decisions and, and, and leveraging them, reviewing them, and making sure they apply to the best manner possible to, to future events. I think people are making, they're trying to handle lots of things on a one-off situation. Make sure you don't paint yourself into a corner by uh, going too far into the, the one-off type of um, arena. Make sure you're trying to stick to these policies as consistently as you can. Key person dependencies. This is uh, really, really critical to me. Many organizations have a, a person or two who their knowledge, skill set, however you want to say that, may be so unique that that person's not easily replaced. And that can be for a number of reasons. You know, maybe it's just organically occurred that way over time. Sometimes that person doesn't want to share the information because they, they think it devalues their, their uh, criticality. Take this time to identify those key people and start to build some sort of knowledge transfer as well as some formal cross-training efforts to make sure that should that person become ill or not be available to come to work for, us, for whatever reason, if you've got a plan in place on how you're going to fulfill their backfill their needs. It's a little too late when you find out they're, they're going to be out for the next two weeks um, that morning. Make sure you, you think through it and give some time to it. Uh, you know, I'll ask you to start thinking about your business priorities. I touched on this a little bit earlier, but the business priorities that you had coming into to COVID-19, you know, I will tell you in, in my career, one of the most common things I've come across is a misalignment of business priorities in normal times. You have several leaders across the organization, and while they all may appear outwardly, for the most part, to have the same priorities, if you put them in a room and ask them each to list the top 10 most important things to your organization in order of importance, it's very rare, and quite honestly, I've never seen it that you have two people with the same list within the organization. 
So understand what those priorities were beforehand. They've probably temporarily shifted. In some cases, they, they may have shifted long term. So, you know, I really want you to look at that from your business, your strategic standpoint, your customers. You know, is your the customer base, was your bell cow coming into this event? Is that going to be the same group coming out of this? You know, are we going to change our, our, our niches, our strategies? Can we support every customer in the same way we did in the past? As well as suppliers. You know, you may have had some suppliers who haven't been reliable to this point and will not be reliable. Some other ones may have presented themselves that are tremendously reliable. Um, you know, just really, really think about organizational agreement on these priorities before the current time, during, and, and, and potentially post-pandemic um, wave. From a risk management perspective, this is an overly simple diagram, but it's better for purpose. Whenever you're doing anything, um, and I've got some axes flipped around here to kind of make a point, but whenever you're doing anything else to your business, if your employees or, or anything you enter, you've got a risk reward equation. You know, when, when you think about the risk that you have, the more risk that you have in place of any particular situation, you need to increase control. So I want you to really think about the order of what you're focusing and spending your time on right now. And this is, like I said, very simplistic, but a recovery order. In a perfect world, you're going to try and restore or rebuild or focus and support the areas with the lowest risk and the highest reward to the organization. And, and you build back a how you're going to build your priorities and, and uh, resume your operations to the organization. Like I said, very, very sim simple thought process and approach, but everyone intuitively has this in their mind a little bit, but if you don't formally document and formally talk about it, it may not become as, may not be as relevant as, as it should be. You know, what order is in each one of these circles is up to you and your organization. But understand, if I go to the, somewhere up here in, in the five area, you know, I've got to have a pretty decent level of controls in place in order to consider this mid-reward type activity. So, so really, really give that some helpful dialogue to, to walk through that. I'll give you also some considerations from an owner standpoint, supply chain, and subcontractors. And I will lean on Tim a little bit here to interject um, anything as it relates to the next handful of slides as well. We have uh, you know, one. Uh, Jim, we have one question, and maybe as you transition, you and Tim could uh, elaborate on uh, SDI best practices uh, during the uh, this time frame. Sure, Glenn. Uh, so SDI, the um, good news is we have not seen, and the industry has not seen much in the way of SDI claims arising out of this. It's frankly, I think, too early. Same with the surety industry. Um, the guidance from the SDI insurers is to communicate with them. So um, I know we have we had a client who was going to enroll five new projects, and the the underwriter wanted to know specifically for each project um, how they were addressing the uh, financial ability of their subs, how uh, they were addressing supply chain, um, and uh, and um, uh, so part of it is they may ask you some specific questions. However, um, I think that the underwriters would prefer to be engaged um, so that they don't have to guess as to what you're doing to, to do those controls. And then secondly, I think, you know, it's really important that you communicate with your subs. You have to understand their um, what sort of supply chain issues that they're running into, um, and you have to, you know, if you did a, a financial prequel on them a year ago, it's really, you know, you know, doesn't apply today. So it's very, very important for you to understand where's their liquidity today, what's their WIP look like, so that you can understand and assess, and you may have to put in some mitigation controls on some subs that six, you know, six months ago you didn't feel you, you needed to do. So th those would be the two areas that I would uh, I would focus in on both around communication and understanding. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I will pick back up with some consideration for uh, you know owners. 
you know, there's probably a lot of dialogue right now and uncertainty around, you know, reimbursement resulting from the delay, you know, from how it's impacted general conditions to acceleration costs to catch projects up um, if it's even viable. So, you know, I encourage you to, to really be actively engaging with your uh, your customers and your subs in these conversations to make sure you're as being as transparent as you can be. You also may have a potential um, that some jobs may not be continued. They might be abandoned, you know, based on the, the financial hardship that many people are going through. Some projects may be being canceled altogether. You know, even midstream, we've had some, uh, you know, talk of that. You know, so so let's be very, very conscious of understanding the potential uncertainty around all this space. Also, from a jurisdictional standpoint, um, I really want you to think about, and, and this should not be the case, however it is, is that every jurisdiction is handling this a little bit differently. We should have uniform across the state. We do not. We don't even have, we don't have uniform within a particular um, jurisdiction. So just be aware that the measures you put in place and the controls you put in place may vary and may change a bit by uh, jurisdiction. Be very, very clear with that. Employee communication, keep it up and be transparent. You know, we talked about that before. From a, uh, a supply chain perspective, um, the construction industry gets a tremendous amount of goods from um, from Asia. And this is um, gonna be of increasing concern from, from people going forward. You know, their, their control measures for the COVID-19, while they, they haven't necessarily been transparent, I don't believe, but um, they have taken some pretty draconian measures. And as a result, I think the suppliers um, in China, their financial health can be questioned, okay? So, you know, a lot of them may not come back the same way they were if they come back at all. Um, so you always be looking for, for multiple ways, multiple sources of key and critical supplies. There's also potential issues, and this is, um, Tim might be able to comment on this, but also the quality of incoming goods, you know. Typically when you have a factory overseas, um, you will have inspectors who go in periodically just to make sure the quality is meeting what we expect here in the state. And due to the, la the uh, increase or the travel ban, those inspections have not been able to occur. So do I think quality might or will last? I won't say that, but I won't say it, it certainly could. Um, so, you know, keep an increased eye out on um, materials coming onto your job site. Um, from a cost and timing perspective, you know, ports are, are all jammed up right now. You know, they're jammed up because people are not able to receive the goods because they have nowhere to go with them. So there's significant delays in ports right now, which may, they may try and find a way to expedite that. Or you might have to pay additional costs for something that, that's already readily available. So the supply chain is absolutely critical. I want you to always think about the entire supply chain. Um, you know, I want you to think of it from beginning to end to the best of your ability. Today, or to date, probably most of what you thought of is the person you're buying the stuff from. Question them, encourage them, you know, dig into those conversations to make sure that, that you're comfortable that they're gonna be able to continue to provide the uh, supplies that you need. You may need to, prioritize and target very, very specific items. And it's not going to be across the board, but there may be a few things that are so critical to, to what you do that you want to, to find multiple ways to, to gain those those key, key areas. You know, keep that transparency into the, uh, the supply chain. You know, monitor to the best of your ability. You know, if you understand something that happens overseas can impact the supply chain here, Keep an eye out for those conditions to start presenting themselves. Much like the longshoremen um, labor dispute out in California, exact same thing. We saw that coming, we knew it was coming, and hopefully you weren't hit by that one too bad. But this can be much, much more significant and severe. Um, as well as, you know, just make sure you've got flexibility in, in the materials and the supplies you're getting. Hey, Jim, just a comment. So on the supply chain issue, you know, three weeks ago, the uh, trucking industry, their the number of loads they were transporting, it was actually up 15% year over year. Uh, since then, it's decreased 35%. And what this means is we're gonna, they, it's expected that uh, you know, truckers, uh, smaller truckers are gonna go out of business. And so it's gonna just delay uh, getting the materials even 
even longer. So that material uh, supply chain risk is definitely uh, critical when it comes to getting materials for, you know, for the project. And good point, Tim. It's not just the international, it's the, the domestic. And I, I saw that exact same study. You know, there's going to be a ripple effect. You know, it's going to take them time to, to ramp that back up, um, just like anything else. Um, everything here seems to be a ripple effect. So, you know, um, when I start thinking about, you know, subs, you know, really, really do your best to validate, you know, your financial situation. Make sure that the attention you're spending on particular projects and particular customers of yours are in the right place to help ensure your long-term viability. You may not be able to support everything that dealer want to, but you need to be in a position to, uh, to make sure you're making the best long-term decision. Um, really, really work on uh, thinking about the, the time needed and the logistics around resetting the project. It's very, very difficult, and I've got a slide on that coming up. But, um, you know, really think about also um, how you're going to support and how you interact with schedule modifications. You know, are you, in order to catch a job up, are you, are you willing and are you financially able to provide the overtime needed to, to catch the job up? As well as keep an eye out for your own protocols that you're gonna put into place now to increase social distancing and that sort of thing. But also you're gonna need to align what you're doing with the minimum standard set by your, your GC. So there needs to be a lot of dialogue and conversation there. going to project restart considerations. Um, it's not going to be as simple as, hey, I walked walked out on a Thursday and came back on a Friday. It's not going to be the same. It, it's, for those of you who have not continued, um, it, it's going to be very, very different. Your employee confidence is going to be shaken. You know, some people may be overly fearful of getting in close contact with others. You're going to have increased training related to how you're doing the social distancing. You know, if you um, acquire PPE, you know, there's quite, quite a run on that right now, but also if you happen to, if you're only able to acquire respirator type PPE that would dictate and trigger the need for a written respirator program, you don't already have one, you know, that, that's another um, potential trap you can get yourself into. Thinking about pending inspections, you know, many jobs cannot go forward until the uh, local authority has inspected the site. There might be a backlog of those, so in spite of you doing everything you can within your power you have one single piece here that is going to hold up your project and your ability to move forward or maybe design changes you know people want to redesign additional things into the, the, their plans right now to um to accommodate social distance in, in the new normal that we're going to have you know make sure you also get everyone together and be transparent do what you can now you know very similar to a, a uh, initial project kickoff meeting, get everyone together, talk about, you know, potential issues, talk about your, your initial thoughts. And this needs to be a, as much of a collaboration as possible. But, you know, the, if you get a group together who's been thinking about this for a while, you can generally come up with some very good creative solutions. So I really, really encourage you to not try and make the decision for everybody, but try and have a collaborative conversation with all, your, all of your business partners. That is all I have, Glenn. I think that was uh, pretty quick to get through as much content. So I'd like to uh, open it up for questions if anyone has any. Sure, appreciate uh, uh, both of your, uh, both Tim and Jim, your time uh, today. Um, you know, I know the original coverage topic was about, uh, you know, insurance and COVID-19, but I think your presentation and comments around things that we can do as businesses, contractors to prepare for the future uh, is also uh, important. You know, it's, it seems like, in, you know, just from a general sense, um, many cases, uh, there's a, a feeling that we never have enough cur coverage, right? That we talk to our insurance, our risk partners, and, you know, we add coverage, but the evolution of, uh, I guess, new circumstances and uh, scenarios in our society, you know, seemingly continue to dictate uh, that there be both a review and or consideration for additional coverages. Any closing thoughts or comments from uh, either of you on, um, you know, how to best approach ensuring that we're buttoned down pretty tightly? Yeah, Glenn, this is Tim. So a uh, great, great question. And basically, you know, to expand on, you know, a comment 
I made earlier, you asked about how's the insurance industry responding. You know, I, I gave you the insurance company um, perspective. Um, we're insurance brokers. So our job is to advocate as much as possible for our clients to try to get them protection when there's when there's a covered claim. So I think you have these um, two opposing forces within the marketplace and that as brokers, we're trying to find coverage and as carriers, they're saying this was never intended to be um, insured and we didn't collect premium for it and we don't feel we have an obligation for it. I think one of the contexts that's important to understand is with insurance, they tend to uh, provide coverage based on probabilities of what they expect, right? And it's usually historical lookbacks. So when you have an emerging trend, we saw this with cyber insurance, you know, five, seven years ago, there was no cyber insurance um, uh, market. And then it just continues to evolve. And as these issues evolve and there is no coverage, uh, the, un the underwriters tend to look at what are the exposures? What are other historical uh, data sets that we can review to try to credibly come up with a rate and terms and conditions uh, to offer the coverage? And in the case of cyber, you've seen that market uh, evolve you know, constantly uh, since that time. So again, as I said initially, you know, ultimately the insurance carrier is the only one who can make a coverage determination. And so we um, would advocate that you get together with your insurance agents, look at your policies, um, look at a, in the context of what you, um, uh, what is the claim that you would be uh, reporting to the to the carrier, and also track all those job costs and additional costs that are related to um, this pandemic, because if in fact a court in Ohio, the Ohio Supreme Court says, um, uh, you know, that, that, that the coverage under this circumstance is in the policy, um, you're gonna wanna have all that documentation. So th hopefully that's helpful, but um, Jim, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, no, not from a, necessarily from an insurance perspective, but how proper planning um, dovetails with, um, uh, and proper insurance coverage. You know, I, I think many times people rely too much on insurance as a silver bullet that is going to ensure their long-term viability. You know, if you look at national statistics, about four out of five companies that have a major business and interruption event like this that we're going through right now, four out of five of those um, who don't have formal planning processes or well-thought-out approaches in place, end up going out of business in three to five years. And that is with coverage being applied for um, a more traditional type of event. So the fact that if I'm made financially whole after a period of, you know, indemnity, you know, whether it be 10, 12 months, whatever it is, and I open my doors and all my customers are gone, I'm probably gonna struggle. So I just want you to, to make sure to, to think through that insurance to me for your long-term viability is your last line or I'll say a line of defense strategic long-term planning is, is what you should be thinking about to uh, help ensure the viability of your organization. Okay. Uh, good, good perspective. And again, uh, we appreciate it. Um, you know, again, it's important for our industry to stay informed and connected. And again, we'll con encourage um, uh, both our partners, Tim and Jim, to uh, continue to share with CEA so that we can share with our members and our industry uh, relevant tips, best practices, and considerations. Um, Oswald will be partnering uh, with Franz Ward on an upcoming uh, webinar on May 6th on cybersecurity. And Tim uh, spoke about that earlier uh, during this webinar and again, encourage that as a, a strong consideration for um, all of our members. Think of those of you who are tuned on, our, on the screen, uh, just wanna announce a couple of upcoming webinars uh, this Friday at noon. Uh, we'll be doing one on making the most of the paytech, Paycheck Protection Loans, uh, which were part of the federal government stimulus program. Um, and essentially, we want to help you ensure that that loan becomes a grant. And there are some considerations and best practices and suggestions uh, to help uh, those who have received any 
of federal disaster uh, money from the payroll paycheck protection program. Um, also, I think this morning I'm told that I think the Senate passed a, an additional uh, stimulus bill. So for those of you who may not have had an opportunity to submit or receive funding uh, through that SBA program, uh, which you must apply through your banks, uh, this Friday at noon will be a good uh, opportunity to understand uh, both how to ensure uh, that those uh, loans become grants, but also uh, some updates and considerations on uh, applying for the new funds, which uh, will be released either later this week or early next week. Um, also encourage members to those on the line or audience today to, to know that the state, county, and many cities have uh, stimulus programs as does the Federal Reserve uh, Bank that uh, you can find all that information on the CEA uh, homepage under the COVID-19 page. Uh, there's a uh, great resource of information there uh, regarding um, uh, both uh, uh, safety uh, as well as business uh, considerations uh, during and impacted by the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic. Um, we also uh, want to uh, let you know that next Wednesday, um, our regular Wednesday webinar, will be on business continuity and accounting uh, considerations. And there were a couple of uh, tax laws that were changed uh, here in the last uh, six weeks around the COVID-19 and the uh, Treasury Department has changed a few things from the accounting reporting aspect. And then there's a little bit of update that I think Jim covered today on uh, uh, planning and business continuity and things that we all could be doing relative to ensuring our businesses are alive and viable. So with that, I will uh, uh, say thank you for joining us. Um, and please make sure to uh, let us know if you have any questions or suggestions. And uh, Jim and Tim, appreciate again your uh, time this afternoon. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks.